Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning dear students, this is the first lecture of this course, course name Modern India. The first lecture is India in the mid 18th century. What were the major developments took place in the mid 18th century in India? Mainly three developments took place of which the first one was decline and disintegration of the mighty Mughal empire. It was followed by the emergence of regional powers in different parts of the country, coincided with the establishment of British power. These two major developments took place by the mid 18th century in India. In this lecture, we will be looking the first development, the decline and disintegration of the Mughal Empire. The reasons behind the decline and disintegration of the Mughal Empire were many. In this lecture, we will be discussing the major reasons behind the decline of the Mughal Empire. It includes weak successes of Aurangzeb, foreign invasions led by Nadir Shah and Ahmad Shah Abdali, war of succession or civil war and the role played by the nobility leading to the decline, Jahir Dairi and agrarian crisis will also be looked into. We will examine how Jahir Dairi and agrarian policies resulted the decline of the Mughal Empire. First of all, let us look at the weak successes of Aurangzeb. Even during the lifetime of Aurangzeb, the stability of the empire had been shaken because of the powerful army and the administration led by Aurangzeb. The stability got retained, but the successes of Aurangzeb could not withstand this. Immediately after the death of Aurangzeb, his three sons engaged in fierce battle for power. In the struggle for power, the 65 year old Bagadursha came out victorious with the flying colors and he ascended to the throne as the Mughal emperor after Aurangzeb. No doubt, Bhagadursha was a learned man and his policy to other religious group was tolerant. He reversed many of the policies which had been pursued by Aurangzeb. Now, let us look at the policy pursued by Bhagadursha towards the Rajput. It was during the period of Aurangzeb, he got engaged in the destruction of Hindu temples. But Bhagadursha reversed this policy and no Hindu temples were destructed during the period of Bhagadursha. With regard to the Rajput policy, followed by Bhagadursha, he tried to establish control on two Rajput states. One was Ampere and the another one was Marwar. Jai Singh was the Jai Singh. He was the ruler of Ampere. 
Bhagadur Shah wanted to replace Jai Singh with his younger brother Vijay Singh as the ruler of Amber. He also forced another Rajput ruler Ajit Singh of Marwar to submit before, before Mughal authority. This Rajput policy pursued by Bhagadur Shah attracted stiff resistance from the Rajputs. In addition to the replacement of Rajput rulers, Bhagadur Shah also tried to garrison the two cities of Amber and Jodhpur. It further strained the relationship between the Rajput and Bhagadur Shah. Because of stiff resistance posed by Rajput rulers, Bhagadur Shah was forced into reconciliation with the Rajput rulers. Because of this, Bhagadur Shah restored the states of Amber to Raja Jai Singh and Ajit Singh was allowed to continue his rule of Marwar. Now, let us look at the policy pursued by Bhagadur Shah towards Marathas. Like the reconciliation policy adopted by Bhagadur Shah towards the Rajput rulers, he followed the same policy with regard to the Marathas of Western India. While he granted Sardesh Mughi of the Deccan to the Marathas, Sardesh Mughi was a kind of tax collected by the Maratha rulers from the time of Shivaji. It was 10 percent of the total produce. Another tax came in the Nonas Chauth. It was one fourth or 25 percent of the total agricultural production. While Bhagadur Shah allowed Sardesh Mughi of Dakkan to the Marathas, he declined to grant Chauth to the Maratha rulers. He also did not recognize Shahu as the rightful ruler of the Marathas. It resulted struggle for power between two rival Maratha groups. One was led by Shahu and another one was Tarabai. It only created disorder and chaos in Dakan. Now, the policy adopted by Bhagadur Shah towards the Sikh. Bhagadur Shah wanted to establish peace with the rebellious Sikh. He granted a high mansab to Sikh leader Guru Gobinda Singh. He was the last Sikh Guru. After the death of Gobinda Singh, the Sikh raised the banner of revolt under the leadership of popular leader Bandh Bahadur in Punjab against the Mughals. Once the Sikh started rebellion against the Mughals, Bhagadur Shah decided to suppress these rebellions with the iron hand. However, he was not able to suppress the rebellions of the Sikh community. Bhagadur Shah also consolidated Chatarsal. He was the chief of the Bundelas and the Jat chief Churaman with whom he reconciliated. Churaman helped Bhagadur Shah in the campaign against the Bandhu Bahadur, the leader of Sikh. Now, these were the policies adopted by Bhagadur Shah towards the Rajabuts, Marathas and the Sikh communities. From the policy pursued by Bhagadur Shah, it became clear that most of his policy was reconciliation. Administration under Bhagadur Shah 
the administration under Bhagadursha got further deteriorated. He could not ensure a stable income. The royal treasury got worsened because of reckless grants and jahidars granted by Bhagadursha. During the period of Bhagadursha, from 1707 to 1712, 13 crore rupees got exhausted from the royal treasury of the Mughals. Given the time, no doubt Bhagadursha would have been revived the strength of the Mughal power. But unfortunately, the death of Bhagadursha in 1712 led to another civil war. The death of each Mughal emperor resulted in civil war. The next ruler was Jagandar Shah. He ruled only a brief period of around one year. But during this time, a new elements entered into Mughal politics. What was these new elements? Earlier, during the course of the civil war, the struggle for power was confined among the royal princes. The nobles merely aided the contenders for power. But now, this attitude of the nobles came to an end. Ambitious nobles became the direct contenders for power. Not only the princes, but also the nobles engaged in the fray for power. And the princes became mere pawns to capture power. Now come to the civil war following the death of Bhagadur Shah. How did Jagandar Shah come into power? He came into power with the help of one of the most powerful noble of his time. It was none other than Sulfikar Khan. Sulfikar Khan was a powerful noble during this time. It was with the support and the backing of Sulfikar Khan, Jagandar Shah was able to come into power. This new elements began to decide the fact of Mughal rulers. Jagandar Shah was a very weak ruler. However, it was Sulfikar Khan with whom the actual administrative power was vested. Sulfikar Khan the noble, he was well aware that it was necessary to establish friendly relations with the Rajput rulers as well as the Maratha Sardars to maintain the stability of the empire. He was also well aware that it was necessary to maintain friendly relations with the Hindu chiefs to continue the Mughal ruler. Because of this, Sulfikar Khan adopted the policies accordingly. He totally reversed the policies pursued by Aurangasip. What were the policies followed by Aurangasip? He was at war with the Marathas and the Rajput rulers and the prominent Hindu chiefs. Sulfikar Khan changed this policy. He abolished the Jesiya and his policy towards the Rajabuts was also well clear that he wanted to maintain the stability of the empire. The ruler of Ambar Jai Singh was given the title of 
मिर्सा राजा सवाई मिर्सा राजा सवाई एंड ही वॉज ऑल्सो गिवन द गवर्नरशिप ऑफ वन ऑफ द प्रोमिनेंट प्रोविंस ऑफ मालवा अनदर राजा वुड रूलर अजीत सिंह ऑफ मारवार विथ हूम सुल्फी खान अवार्डेड द टाइटल ऑफ महाराज अजीत सिंह वॉज अपॉइंटेड एज द गवर्नर ऑफ वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट प्रोविंस ऑफ गुजरात हिज फ्रेंडली रिलेशन विथ मराठा रूलर्स वॉज ऑल्सो एमड टू establish a stable empire following which he granted chauth and sardesh muhi to the madharata rulers of dakhan chauth was one fourth of the total production collected in the form of tanks and sardesh muhi was over and above the chauth and it was estimated at 10% of the total produce likewise he also adopted friendly relations with jat ruler churaman and the bundela ruler chatarsal with whom sulfikar khan adopted friendly relations he adopted the policy of suppression only towards two groups one the sikh and bend bahadur however he tried to maintain friendly relations with the rajabuts marathas jat and bundelas he did not take any well concerted measures for improving the past deflecting mughal economy the period of jagandar shah came to an end in 1713 he reigned only a brief period of around 1 year jagandar shah was defeated at agra by farooq siyar his nephew and farooq siyar became the next mughal ruler with the support of sayed pradesh they were the king makers of the mughals abdullah khan and hussein ali they popularly known as sayed pradesh they played a key role in the defeat of jagandar shah and the coming of farooq siyar in the power in order to reward the services rendered by sayed pradesh sayed pradesh give were given two important posts one was wasir and then mir bakshi abdullah khan and hussein ali sayed pradesh were rewarded with the services with the important posts of wasir and mir bakshi respectively abdullah khan became the wasir diwan he was the next important personality of the mughal administration Mir Bakshi was the head of the military department. Abdullah Khan was made the Wasir or Diwan, and Mir Bakshi was the Hussain Ali. Soon, the Sayed Pradesh began to dominate the affairs of the state. Farooq Siyar, like Jagandar Shah, was a very weak, weak ruler, and he could not run. the administration of the state well however he was an incapable person to run the administration of the empire properly he was not ready to share power with uh, sayed pradesh it embittered sayed pradesh and the ruler likewise many of the nobles in the mughal court also disliked the superior power enjoyed by sayed pradesh they conspired against the sayed pradesh in 1720 husain ali khan was killed 
it was followed by the defeat of Abdullah Khan at Agra. So, these two Sayyid brothers, Hussain Ali and Abdullah, were eliminated from the Mughal power by 1720. The Sayyid brothers, who were popularly known as kingmakers of Indian history, and their dominance came to an end by 1720. Another Mughal ruler was none other than Muhammad Shah Rengila. He popularly known as Rengila because of his fondness with music. He ruled the Mughal Empire for a longer duration of 30 years from 1719 to 1748. As far as Muhammad Shah was concerned, it was the last chance to save the empire. However, he neglected the affairs of the state. He did not rise to the occasion. He was led by inefficient, corrupt ministers. His father was a able administrator. It was Nizam ul -Mulk. Because of incapability of Muhammad Shah Rengila, Nizam ul -Mulk left the Mughals in 1724. He established an independent state of Hyderabad in 1724. Taking advantage of the incapability of Mughal ruler Muhammad Shah Rengila, the powerful and ambitious rulers tried to carve out independent kingdoms instead of losing their energy for Muhammad Shah Rengila. The period of Muhammad Shah Rengila witnessed the invasion of Nadir Shah from Persia. He firstly entered India in 1738. His army met the Mughal forces at Karnal on 13 February 1739. In this war between Nadir Shah and the Mughal forces, the Mughal forces were completely defeated. The Emperor Muhammad Shah was taken prisoner and proceeded to Delhi. What did Nadir Shah do at Delhi? He engaged in massacring of the citizens of imperial capital and looted royal treasury. It was estimated that he took away around 70 crore of rupees from India, following which he extend, exempted his own kingdom from taxation for another three years. A huge wealth was taken away by Nadir Shah from India. He took away the famous Kohinoor diamond and the jewel studded at Peacock throne of Shah Jahan. These immense valuables were taken away by Nadir Shah from India. In addition to that, Muhammad Shah was required to siege the territories lying west of the river Indus. Now, India was again exposed to foreign attacks through the northwest of the country. Nadir Shah's invasion inflicted immense damage on the Mughal Empire. With the failure of the Mughals, in the war with Nadir Shah, the weakness of the Mughal Empire got exposed not only to the Maratha Sardars, but to the Europeans like Portuguese, French and the British. One of the main consequences of the Nadir Shah's invasion was 
it economically ruined the country. Not only the country, but also the nobles and semintars were also ruined. Their immense wealth were also taken away by Nathrusha, the invader. So, the semintars and the nobles turned their attention to further exploit the peasants to recover their lost wealth. As mentioned earlier, the loss of Kabul and the areas west of the river Indus once again opened the threat to India through northwestern part of the country, who were the successors of Muhammad Shah. Again, after the death of Muhammad Shah, civil war broke out among the power hungry nobles. Akamad Shah became the next Mughal ruler. He ruled from 1748 to 1754. In 1754, Alamgir II became the next Mughal ruler and he continued to rule till 1759. In 1759, Alamgir II died. He was succeeded by Shah Alam II. He ruled a longer duration of 46 years from 1760 to 1806. Another invasion took place during the period of Shah Alam II. It was led by none other than the successor of Nadir Shah, Agamad Shah Abdali. Agamad Shah Abdali was one of the powerful generals of Nadir Shah. Agamad Shah Abdali established his authority over Afghanistan after the death of Nadir Shah. Nadir Shah seriously attacked the country and plundered India from 1748 to 1767. In 1761, the forces of Agamad Shah Abdali met Marathas under the leadership of Sadashiva Rao at the battlefield of Panipat. In the ensuing war between Maratha forces led by Sadashiva Rao and Ahmad Shah Abdali, Marathas were shattered and defeated. However, he defeated the powerful Marathas in 1761 through the third battle of Panipat. Ahmad Shah Abdali did not establish an empire in India. Even he did not retain Punjab which was soon lost to Sikh community. Coming to the end of the Mughal Empire, the invasions of Nadir Shah and Agamad Shah Abdali and internal feuds among the nobility of the Mughals, the Mughals as an All India Empire virtually came to an end by 1761. It lost the status of All India Empire by 1761 and it confined as a kingdom of Delhi. However, Shah Alam II, as told you earlier, he came into power in 1760. However, he was a man of ability, but the empire was now beyond redemption. In 1764, in another war in which the Mughal ruler Shah Alam II, Mir Qasim of Bengal and Shuja Dawla of Aut took one side against the British. In this battle of Bexar, fought on 22nd October 1764, 
the combined armies of Mughal ruler Shah Alam II, Mirkasim of Bengal, and Shuja ud Dawla of Aud got defeated. After the Battle of Bexar of 1764, Shah Alam II became a mere pensioner of the British. In 1803, the British completely occupied Delhi. Now going to see the major reasons behind the decline and disintegration of the Mughal Empire. Aurangzeb's empire consisted a vast area which could not be ruled from the center because of the transport and communication problems. Secondly, Aurangzeb he used it to fight against the Marathas for a longer duration of 25 years, leading to the depletion of the royal treasury. He also used it to remain outside of North India for 25 years. It further retaliated the administration in North India and the powerful rulers in North India eagerly waiting to establish or reassert their independence. Likewise, he also engaged in war with the Rajabuts. Had Aurangzeb been avoided the war with the Rajabuts and the Marathas, the Mughal Empire got further strengthened, but Aurangzeb failed to understand this fact. Akbar, who was well aware that the Rajabuts were the real strength of the Mughal administration, he maintained friendly relations with the Rajabuts. But Aurangzeb reversed this policy. He not only embittered the Maratha and Rajabut rulers, on religious ground, he was a religious fanatic and hurted the religious sentiments of the Hindus by demolishing Hindu temples and imposition of Jaziya on non-Muslims. Jaziya was a kind of tax imposed on non-Muslims for the protection given by the Muslim rulers. However, he adopted anti-Hindu policies. The number of Mansabdars did not reduce in Mughal administration during the period of Aurangzeb. In addition to the anti-Hindu policies and unfriendly relations with the Rajabut and the Maratha rulers, Another major reason behind the decline and disintegration of the Mughal Empire was none other than civil war, which broke out immediately after the death of each emperor. There was no fixed rule of succession. Who would come into power after the death of a ruler? Only the civil war decided who would be the next ruler. The winner became the next ruler. The war of succession did immense harm to the Mughal Empire, leading to the loss of property and life. Thousands of well-trained soldiers lost their lives. Hundreds of military commanders and officials were killed in the war of succession. It was a great loss to the Mughal Empire. The nobility which formed the backbone of the Mughal Empire, also engaged into warring factions during the course of the War of Succession. The War of Succession was used by an opportune time by many nobles, officials and semintars. 
to consolidate their own position, taking the chaos and uncertainty. Like the weak successes of Aurangzeb, the nobility also played a key role in the decline and disintegration of the Mughal Empire. The strength of the Mughal Empire lay in the organization and the character of his nobility. The Mughal Empire ought to have been saved by the nobles, but the nobility did not come forward to save the empire. The character of nobility was also deteriorated. The nobles used to lead a very luxurious and extravagant life. Their timely intervention ought to have been saved the empire from decline. Even if the rulers were weak, inefficient and corrupt, but this nobility did not rise on the occasion. This nobility whose families monopolized the higher echelons of Mughal administration. They were appointed to the high offices overlooking merit. These nobles were mutually jealous, quarreled with each other and corruption was rampant among them. Another reason was Jahir Dari crisis. The Jahir Dari crisis was brought into light by none other than eminent historian Sadish Chandra. Through this Jahir Dari crisis, Sadish Chandra argues that the decline and disintegration of the Mughal Empire was due to the failure to maintain the system of Mansabdar and Jahirdar. How did this system work? In lie of cash salary, these military officials were given revenue bearing lands. These Mansabdar Jahirdars collected revenue from this land in lie of cash salary these military officials were given revenue bearing lands they were not given any cash salary these officials collected revenue from the respective land and after defraying the expenses incurred on the maintenance of army or troop the remaining amount was given to royal treasury. But it was during the period of Aurangasi, this Mansabdari Jagirdari system failed to work. Sadish Chandra's thesis argues that it was because of the failure of this Jagirdari Mansabdari system the Mughal Empire declined. Another prominent historian, Adar Ali, whose argument goes that the number of Jahirdars increased due to the extension of the Mughals into new areas of Deccan and Maratha territory. Adar Ali argues that because of the extension of Jahir darts into new areas the terror the system worsened. The revenue from Jahir Dari lands got declined. Another prominent historian, Nural Hassan, whose thesis was that agrarian crisis resulted the decline of the Mughals. According to Nural Hassan, the agrarian relations in Mughal India worked like a pyramid, superimposing various kinds of rights upon each other. 
it was like a pyramid and in the last stage it was persons on whom the burden of taxation imposed it resulted crisis in the agrarian economy another study was made by prominent historian irfan kafif who study also related to agrarian crisis which was considered as the reason behind the decline and disintegration of the mughal empire he made an in-depth study of the collapse of the mughal empire in his seminal work agrarian system of mughal india in his work he goes into detailed analysis of how agrarian crisis resulted in the decline of the mughal empire he argues that the land tax was high under the mughals in addition to this land tax the jahirs the jahir that's also exploited the persons the exploitation of the jahir that's mansab that's as well as the highest revenue demand of the state resulted persons protest in different parts of the country the persons had no option other than to protest against the high revenue demand of the state as well as the exploitation by the jahirdars on slightest pretext the protest of the persons came in different ways in different places the protest of the persons was not uniform throughout the country it differed from place to place in some places the peasant protested against the state by refusing to pay the revenue demand of the state in some places the peasants declined to pay land tax while in other places the peasants were up in arms irwan kafif argues that the peasants protest weakened the political and social fabric of the empire what were the effects of the decline and disintegration of the mughal empire the decline and disintegration of the mughal empire created disastrous effects in india the first effect of the decline and disintegration of the mughal empire was that since then there was no all india empire the status of all india empire was lost and on this regional kingdoms and rulers established their own independent power for example in bengal murshid kuli khan set up the independent state of bengal then hyderabad nizam ul mulk asafja he was the wazir of muhammad shah rengila because of the inability of muhammad shah rengila nizam ul mulk asafja left the post of wazir and he established an independent state in dakkan that is hyderabad then in mysore in mysore hyderali hyderali was a petty officer in the hindu odayar family of the mysore from the status of a petty army officer hyderali rose in the prominence of a military commander 
he modernized the mysore army with the support of the french army personnel in 1761 hyder ali captured from the odayar hindu rulers odayar rulers hyder ali set up an independent kingdom of mysore this state of mysore was further extended by the son and successor of hyder ali tipu sultan the jats marathas farukabad and rohilkand all these states were newly emerged as a result of the decline and disintegration of the mughal empire the consequences of the mughal empire was disastrous there was no all india empire to fight against the invaders the british also took the advantage of the decline and disintegration of the mughal empire leading to the establishment of british power initially in bengal and later in different parts of the country for so the these were the consequences of the decline and disintegration of the mughal empire one was establishment of independent kingdoms secondly the establishment of british power initially in bengal and later in different parts of the country so these are the points which we have it to cover in this lecture we have covered the successes of aurangzeb from 1707 to 1806 over around 100 years most of these rulers were weak and the nobility played a key role and there were many reasons behind the decline and disintegration of the mughal empire in addition to the weak successes of aurangzeb foreign invasions made by nadir shah and his successor ahmad shah abdali civil war failures of the noble city or rise to the occasion jahirdari mansabdari crisis and agrarian crisis together all these together led to the decline and disintegration of the mughal empire on which new states were emerged in the 18th century now the students are able to answer to the following questions critically examine how the jahirdari and ag agrarian crisis led to the decline of the mughal empire what were the consequences of the foreign invasions led by nadir shah and his successor akamad shah abdali who were the rulers of the mughals from 1707 to 1806 and how did the war of succession affect the mughal empire last examine the role of sayed pradesh in mughal empire these are the questions to which you are now able to answer thank you for attending this class thank you
Hi, I'm Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debian Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I'm interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. Uh, measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic BP, you have your incidence of high BP, MAP and incidence of high MAP. And as far as cholesterol is concerned, I have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol, good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol. Now before I go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications, I would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of WHO and various countries. The WHO, that is the World Health Organization, it started with a campaign of five a day. That is, you should have five portions of fruits and vegetables per day. That would be approximately, you could say, 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Now, a portion, before we go further, I'll just tell you what exactly is a portion. One portion is equivalent to a medium-sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice, which is approximately 150 milliliters and uh, maybe three teaspoons of vegetables. So, uh, the WHO went with a five a day campaign, which was further taken up by various countries. Countries like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, they adopted the five a day policy, while some went for expansionary dietary policies like France, Australia, Canada, Denmark. So, for example, Australia, it went for go for 2 plus 5 policy in which it said that you should consume five por 2 portions of fruits and 5 portions of vegetables per day. And USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables, more matters. That is, you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables. Now, irrespect of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations, it has been found that only 28% of women and 25% of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of five a, po five a day portion. So the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables, whether there exists a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators. And if they exist, whether if due to heterogeneity in the data, so I will be doing it according to age, by gender and by uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I, will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter, apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which con conducts information regularly on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or doesn't smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Don't count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits. And uh, like for example, three, por three tablespoons of vegetables is equal into one portion. So data was converted and provided to the users, that is us from the UK Data Health Survey. So the major con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, intake of fruits and self-assessed health, then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits. And as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So if uh, a falsification test is done to know, in a way it is tested by seeing 
an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables. And then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance, body imbalance that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables and we did find insignificant results. Apart from that infectious diseases like HIV, AIDS, HIV, AIDS etc. we found similar insignificant results indicating that our, uh, that our results are not spurious, non spurious. Apart from that we went uh, since there was a, a lot of heterogeneity in the data like uh, by gender, by age and by weight. We, can, we did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, it impacts a male's health more than a female's health. So it is basically said a, a man should consume more fruits to impact his health whereas as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact a women's health more. But this has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned, the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol, good cholesterol and your incidence of getting high cholesterol. Now after this we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication we found, we tried to find two policy implications, what matters and exactly how much portion matters. So as far as how much portion matters, we have found that on an average, five or more portions of fruits impact your overall health, that is your self-assessed health, your MAP, your incidence of high MAP and incidence of high BP. But if you want to have a good mental health, so you can optimize your mental health by consuming three or four portions of fruits as well. And similarly, has, uh, as far as self-assessed health and total cholesterol is concerned, an individual must consume four to five portions to optimally have the impact of consumption of fruits. Apart from that, vegetables have had a very little impact on your health. It only impacts your incidence of getting high MAP and high BP and uh, you, it's seen that only it impacts when you consume five or more portions of fruits. So an optimum consumption of five or more portions of fruits and vegetables are recommended. But fruits have a more impact on your overall health, on various measures like self-assessed health, mental health, your various measures of blood pressure and various cholesterol levels. Another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters. It has been seen that all size fruits, they impact your self-assessed health, your systolic and diastolic blood pressure, your mean arterial pressure, your high BP and incidence of getting high MAP and high cholesterol. But we find that uh, as far as frozen fruits or canned fruits are concerned, they have a, they help in regulating your incidence of getting high MAP or high BP, but it has a trade off that means there is something negative happening, it reduces the good cholesterol in your body. Apart from this, it, if, you ha if you have an incidence of getting high cholesterol, it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a s impact in reducing your probability of getting high cholesterol. And uh, dried fruits, they impact your self-assessed health. As far as vegetables are concerned, very little impact has been seen. It has only been seen in case of uh, uh, portion of salads and its association with self-assessed health. Another thing that they have seen is vegetables in composite, they have an association with good cholesterol. So overall, my research basically says that there is an association between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. And um, it is highly recommended that an individual in order to be healthy must consume 5 or more portions of fruits and 5 or more portions of vegetables per day. But fruits have a more impact on your overall health. Apart from that, all size fruits, they have a better impact on your overall health, your mental health, various measures of blood pressure and cholesterol. So thank you.